uh, Brian Murphy, uh, Eileen Dunn, Willie Keithy, and the rest of the Kennedy Summer School team. Uh, it's a very great pleasure uh, to welcome you all uh, to the official opening of uh, the 2019 Kennedy Summer School. As ever, and as the brochure to which we made a few mi minor alterations that we will apprise you of over the weekend, <coughs> the brochure shows that we have an action-packed three days ahead. If you like history, if you appreciate culture, and most especially, if you love politics, you're in the right place here in New Ross. We are absolutely thrilled with our program of events and with the extraordinary caliber of our speakers and contributors this evening. We just came from a wonderful session in the library this evening, on Friday, and on Saturday. Of course, this year uh, is a little different. And we'd be lying if we didn't admit that our hearts are heavy because of the passing of our founder and friend, Noel Whelan. It is his vision that's made the Kennedy Summer School the wonderful event that it is. We will pay tribute to Noel throughout the weekend, and we know he is with us in spirit. It is without any further ado, then, that I'd like to call upon Eileen Dunn of our committee and of our TV News, who will introduce and then interview Seamus Mallon, who will officially open Kennedy Summer School 2019. Thank you very much. Everybody and welcome once again. Um, I think the best legacy that we can pay Noel is to continue and for the school to continue and to thrive and prosper and to that end we'll all be doing our best this weekend. I'm sure Noel would be delighted if he were here this evening to see who we have to officially launch the summer school this year. One of the greatest politicians of our time. It is indeed our great honour and I will speak to him shortly but to introduce to you first, Seamus Mallon. Ladies and gentlemen, could I first of all say how sorry I am but the man that Eileen has spoken about and we have all thought about isn't here. He was, I had never met him, but I read him every week. And it was the type of insight that he was able to give to all of us around this island that will be missed. And he will be missed personally. It's my great pleasure this week uh, to formally open the Kennedy School. John F. Kennedy said many very powerful things. Possibly one of the most powerful but less used is where he said that all the angels aren't on the same side in every argument. And that is patently true. It is true for an organisation such as this, which does and will take what is presented and tease it out in such a way so that people can appreciate it more and understand it better. I also, just in passing, would like to pay a small tribute to one of the Kennedys, Ted, whom I knew very well. He was a man who helped us out on many occasions. In Congress, he was the person who knew his way around. And as a small political party with no presence really in the United States, Ted certainly looked after as well. And I think of him very often when I'm trying to mull over a difficulty 
And sometimes say to myself, now, what would he have said about this? I wish you all a very interesting and uh, pleasant number of days here. I'm looking forward to, to it myself with some trepidation, I have to say. Uh, I know that there will be very difficult questions, but I know Eileen will certainly uh, be putting them. But if there's anyone in the audience who feels that there is something that hasn't been raised, feel free to do so. And with that bit of advice, can we proceed with the opening session this evening? Scotland with the Atchison family and uh, it wasn't until the 1970s when further houses uh, were provided in terms of public housing. It is and was uh, a place with many churches. I think it's seven at the moment. I know when I was a kid but there's many more than that. I'm not suggesting for one moment that there would be that many uh, Christians about the place. <laughs> <laughs> there's an no old saying around where I live that the nearer the chapel, the further from God. <laughs> we had no problem with that because the place like Market Hill at that time Catholic Church couldn't be built except one mile from the village uh, that was settled. So we had no problems with proximity. It had seen over the years tremendous uh, violence from my boys' days. As a boy, the end of the World War, and it was awash with rumours. It was a village that people lived in. Some nobody ever knew where they came from, or why they came there, or anything much about. Them. And of course, in recent years, uh, post-1970, 69, the awfulness of the murder of innocent people uh, began. In my experience, the first uh, was a young man called John Pat Cunningham. He was 
intellectually challenged. He was very shy. But he liked to go out into his mother's field every day and look at the cattle. And of course, an army of Victoria arrived. When he saw them, he ran frightened and pierced. It went on from there to a point where there was a gang set up over two miles from where I live, um, consisting of policemen, serving policemen, serving members of the UDR, the Ulster Defence Regiment, and members of the UVF and UDA. And those, that group of people, killed 132 people in the County Armagh, County Tyrone area. Why do I say that? with such uh, finality. I do it for this reason. Most people didn't believe, nor did I at the beginning, that this was happening. But it became obvious that it had to be done under very senior uh, authority. And as soon as that began to seep out, then it became uh, known. Possibly the first one of that was two fellows coming from Crook Park, uh, uh, Sean Farmer and Colin McCartney, A. Uh, Bogus. UDR patrol <coughs> took them out of the car in a very muddy road, brutalised them and killed them. Now Colin McCartney was a cousin of Seamus Sheenies and Seamus wrote the poem at Lusty Bay uh, about his meeting on the shore with the ghost of his cousin. I used it in the book. I didn't try to read it. And hey God, imagine trying to rewrite anything she ever seen me. <laughs> so I put it there because it speaks for itself. It wasn't the only one. There's another one, John Hewitt, an Armagh, County Armagh man too. He uh, was a uh, Protestant Unionist, although I began to think, as I got to know him, that he wasn't essentially a Unionist. But he making the point about the rightness of the fact that people like himself lived there. And it is one of the things that stayed with me until now. And it is still that's where I got the title for this book, A Shared Home Place. It was a friend of mine whose family had been farming, a reasonably good farm, for 400 years outside near Market Hill. He became a member of the Reserve Police Service through a sense of duty. And of course, the IRA decided that a little green book said he should be killed. Um, because he was a member of the Reserve Police Force. That to me was the example that Hewitt was talking about. This man was part of the British occupying forces, despite the fact that he lived there for 400 years among his neighbours and friends.
Now, through all this, you remained implacably opposed to politics and took the political route. But you say yourself you almost fell into politics. You started out as a teacher? I did. Uh, and I, I suppose, like any young man, I, I enjoyed a good time. Didn't notice things too much until. Um, the civil rights movement in America. The student <coughs> unrest in France. The, 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 the word that was filtering through from South Africa. And we started, as young people, to ask ourselves, hey, what, what have we got? We had gross discrimination, a terribly unjust, a uh, system of justice, if it could be called that. And out of that sprang the civil rights movement. And we know the history of it. We know how it was treated. And it is a seminal moment for many good reasons, but this one especially that the choices were made by all of us on those marches. Were we going to follow the life of Martin Luther King, or were we going to take the pike out of the thatch, as they would say colloquially? It was a fundamental question for all of us. Those times it was very difficult. I always remember standing on at the bottom of Bombay Street after it had been burned up, every house there. Uh, and I remember saying to myself, thank God in the age I am, because it would have been different. But we stood by the opposition to violence. John Hume, a colleague of mine, uh, John, I said a seminal moment, it was on the Gilligan Strand, and the army had uh, started to fire at a march, and John got up on a uh, mound to address the army, and the message was, you may rule us, but you can never get our consent. We do not and will not give you our consent to be governed in this way. And that is something that we have held to since. And held to now, because it is crucially important, I think, as we go into the changing Ireland, an Ireland which is beset by problems the Brexit problem and a British government which is, seems to be insensitive to everything except their own well being. But I don't I don't regret, as a matter of fact, I thank God that at that age we had somehow the inspiration and the example, like Daniel O'Connor, someone who showed us the way to go and how to go down it. And we did that. And that is something which, if we did nothing else, I would be very proud of. positive
the notion of parallel consent. Talk to us a bit about that. Consent in terms of uh, the whole question of Irish unity and the growing demands for uh, a border poll. It is touched off by that. Now, the border poll referred to is a 50% plus one. And I happen to believe that if for a fundamental constitutional change that's going to affect a sizable section of the community that may not terribly wish to have it, that 50% plus one is not enough. We shouldn't forget about the fact that for council elections, we have PR, and for Dáil Ireland elections, we have PR, for European elections, we have PR. And why should we go for a 50% plus one in this, these circumstances? So, I'm firmly of the view that we should be able to quantify somehow the strength or weakness of the unionist input. And that <coughs> is something which has got to be organised. It can't be done, and if we look at the way in which Brexit has come about in Britain, it happened because there was no forward planning it wasn't thought down the line. It was done for a spurious reason. Uh, if we're going to be serious about this, then we have to start and treat it seriously. I had to ask myself one question. The question is this. Is Ireland, north or south, ready for unity? We could all have different views about that. <clears throat> I happen to believe that neither is ready for unity because the groundwork hasn't been done. And with the changes, the demographic changes coming, and they are there, then it's going to come an issue sooner or later. Now, I don't want ever to be part of a process which does to the unions what was done to us in 1921. I don't want to be, to have it on my conscience that another vociferous minority has been pressed back into the situation that they don't want and cannot live with. And if that's the case, then we've got to look very clearly at options. The 32 county socialist republic, I often have never heard that. If, as these changes will come, will there be a 32-county administration? That's a good question. If I were a unionist, I would be down next week at Leinster House, and I'd be saying to the government parties, the opposition parties, change of the population going on. When we come down, could, could you give us fellas a bit of this power sharing that now exists in the north? <laughs> you can imagine the reply. <laughs> but 
given me the wrap up signs already, which you believe, but I can't let you go without asking you about the short term. Um, when you finish this, Theresa May was still in power. You served in the House of Commons. What's your view about what's happened there this week? I think there were two things that summed it up for me. One was in Versailles at the G7 meeting. There was a, a photo of the British Prime Minister sitting with his two feet on the most beautiful in Italy. Highly polished French. <coughs> It was captured, it was a moment of capture. That's what it could happen to anyone. But then when I saw the leader of the house, he <laughs> smiled. <laughs> find anybody and it is sad to see at a time where there's going to be great change that people like that are leading the British government. Theresa May, you know if one of her plans had been taken. Certainly in the north of Ireland would have <coughs> when any hands down because we would have had the book the, the best of both worlds. Now it's a face of penury. So I don't finally, finally do you think Sinn Fein should take their seats? I let me put it this way. We hear accusations all over the place about breaking of the Good Friday Agreement. Sinn Féin are breaking the Good Friday Agreement every day by not taking part in the Executive and the Assembly. DUP are doing the same thing. But it is seems to be incredible because mm -hmm. I watched, as I say, I, I was riveted by the, some of the pictures yesterday. Sinn Féin were in a building close for by all of the interviews were have been done and where the votes should have been cast. And there they were out looking around instead of walking in and casting their votes. And that would have toppled any chance of a uh, no deal. The question, I suppose, goes back to late 1920s. It goes back right through Irish history. Is a principle more important than the application of a principle? Let me put it this way. I know a neighbour of mine will be selling us. He's a good milk house. Milk house. He'll be selling them very shortly. He'll have nowhere to sell his milk to because it's processed down in County Monaco and because of the EU regulations, the Irish government, 
Und noch mehr betüllen Leute. Nicht? Das heißt, ist noch etwas im Mann. Er ist Chancen zu erkennen, dass er auf der Welt war nil. Er kann nicht auf eine supplementary benefit or a black nation, because he had capital to sell. No may not make a profit. I'm not sure that's the type of principle that will sustain a modern society. I'm not sure it's the type of principle that is going to help to solve the problem. And I make a last point, which is this. We started off with the question of violence. And the choices that it posed for all of us at that time. I happen to believe that the day that the IRA shot the first person and bombed the first building. They cleared themselves out of the process of persuading unionism towards the form of unity. But to simplify that, Anybody involved in politics has canvassed. No matter how well you know the people, you go to the door and you're a little bit apprehensive. If you happen to be at the door of a man you've killed and his son or his wife or daughter happens to be coming to take your call, I don't think it's going to be a successful interview. So that if we're going to be serious about the future, I think we've got to look at the at all of the problems straight in the eye, no ambiguity, and decide how we're going to make this Island, a place where it can be a shared home place for all of us. If we do that, a lot of the technical and deep political problems will start to do what they normally 